All right. Well, this is my first virtual conference presentation. Hope everyone is doing well out there. I'll try not to screw this up. Uh, my name is Aaron Dollar. I'm a professor at Yale, and I'm about to share my screen so that I can switch over to PowerPoint and do my talk. So um, I wanted to talk about easy, in quotes, within hand manipulation uh, through underactuated mechanics. And um, just a bit about myself first, uh, I'm going to bring you to the Grab Lab website. Um, we do a, a number of things in my lab related to uh, topics in this workshop. Uh, a few things to note are the Yale Open Hand Project, where we have uh, a large number of our uh, robot hand designs, modular robot hand designs available open source uh, for you to be able to print and fabricate uh, in your lab. Uh, and then um, the YCB object and model set, um, which is now uh, being um, hosted by UMass Lowell and the Nerve Center, um, started in my lab. And if you go to my research page, uh, we kind of organize it by, um, by topic, uh, a large amount of things related to robot grasping and manipulation, um, upper limb prosthetics, uh, a bunch of human grasping and manipulation work, um, also related to the prosthetics work and some other things. Okay, so related to um, what I anticipate other people are talking about related to this workshop, um, tying into human grasping and manipulation, um, I believe uh, that lots of animals can grasp objects effectively. Um, and what sets humans apart is our dexterity and particularly our ability to do within hand manipulation. And related to task-oriented grasping, which is uh, a summary, I think, of the overall workshop topic, um, other than simple pick-and-place tasks, uh, relatively few end-to-end -end manipulation tasks can be completed without manipulating the object within the hand. If you grasp an object, you frequently uh, have to reorient or, or manipulate that object in order to utilize it, such as tool use and a lot of other things. So I think within hand manipulation is really a, uh, a key functionality that relates to human grasping and manipulation and then a lot of grasping and manipulation tasks by robots in built for human environments. So why is robotic grasping and manipulation so challenging? Um, there's lots of, of reasons and lots of challenges. Um, I believe, and, and through how I uh, see the world, um, the, the main issue is that contacts add constraints. So if you think about your hands, uh, before contact, you have a bunch of serial link chains, uh, each of which is fully actuated. So like in this uh, example, there's a three link serial chain here. And uh, each of those links will have its own actuator in order to be able to move in three degrees of freedom in free space. And that's the way we build most of our robot systems, robot arms, robot fingers, et cetera. The issue is that uh, as soon as you make contact, that open serial chain becomes a closed serial chain. Now the contact might not be a full um, joint like shown here, um, but it'll add um, a couple of constraints and reduce degrees of freedom of the whole system. Um, in this example, the three link serial chain uh, went from three degrees of freedom to one degree of freedom after contact. And controlling one degree of freedom of a closed chain with three actuators uh, requires, um, it, it's very difficult that fully constrained mechanism is now over constrained and often highly over constrained uh, and controlling uh, over constrained mechanisms is extremely challenging. Um, the redundancy makes it so that the actuators have to be precisely controlled and coordinated not to fight each other, not to apply undesired forces, uh, etc. And that's especially difficult in the presence of uncertainty where you don't know uh, the contact location. You don't know the properties of the object you're in contact with, or you don't know the precise configuration of your robotic system. 
Um, so a takeaway, um, I actually only have this one takeaway slide, um, but I just wanna get you uh, thinking on your own about your hands and your robotic systems in terms of the overall degrees of freedom of the system, especially after contact. Uh, it really gives you uh, great insight, I think, into the behaviors, capabilities, and limitations uh, of those systems um, and, and the challenges related to those. And a caveat is that many of these situations, especially in uh, multi-fingered hands, have um, complex kinematics akin to parallel mechanisms and can be uh, very difficult to analyze, uh, sometimes even close to impossible to analyze. <clears throat> But uh, I'd like to talk about how underactuated mechanisms can make all of this a lot easier. Um, and the idea is that it allows uh, fingers to be fully articulated without being fully constrained. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and the contacts then add the remaining constraints um, with the idea that the overall system is not over constrained after contact. So my foray into all of this was my PhD work at Harvard with Rob Howe. Um, uh, this is the, um, the end of my PhD work was developing uh, what we call the SDM hand. And there's a single actuator in this hand with eight degrees of freedom. And that actuation is run uh, through a differential transmission such that these fingers are highly uh, adaptive passively to the contacts. So we're just running that actuator to stall the same amount every time, uh, and you can see how, um, how adaptive the system is. <clears throat> now, if you start to look at uh, a multi-fingered hand in contact with an object, um, it looks a lot like a parallel mechanism. Uh, you have a lot of um, serial link chains in parallel with one another that all terminate on an object, which you might be able to see as the platform in a parallel platform. And if you look at uh, traditional parallel mechanisms, uh, the two most famous and, and useful are the Stuart platform and the Delta platform, um, these systems are going to be exactly constrained. So a six degree of freedom Stuart platform has exactly six actuators in the system and a three degree of freedom delta has exactly three actuators, generally. Um, now, each of these legs of, let's say, the Stewart platform, since they're connected to the platform, have to also be able to move in six degrees of freedom, but with only one actuator per leg. So there's six actuators total, one per leg for the six legs. That leaves five passive degrees of freedom in each of these legs um, that have to be there in order to not over constrain the system. Now, when you think about that from the context of hands, um, the challenge really is that the fingers of the hand have to be able to stand alone before contact. Meaning, uh, if you're moving them in free space, you, uh, if you had purely passive joints that would just fall over uh, under their own weight. Um, so purely passive degrees of freedom won't do. But underactuated mechanisms really allow you to actuate under constrained mechanisms uh, such that then when you go and make contact, the overall system can, uh, you, you reduce the chances that the overall system is over constrained, uh, thereby avoiding those challenges that over, that controlling an over constrained system pose. And again, the contacts add constraints, uh, and those constraints can, can, can provide that, that you know, remaining uh, constraint to make the system work. And one of the ideas, like in a practical parallel mechanism, you can get one degree of freedom of manipulation for every one hand actuator. Another way to think about this is if you wanna uh, build a hand that manipulates an object in six degrees of freedom, if you're going to have more than six actuators in that hand, uh, you're going to be over constrained. So here's an example of a hand that we uh, built based on the Stuart platform architecture. We call it the Stuart hand. Uh, and it has, um, it actually has seven actuators. There's an actuator that opens and closes the fingers onto the object. Uh, and then that just applies a constant torque, like a grasping torque onto the object. And then the, um, the linear actuators there are the ones that uh, end up 
um, manipulating the object around by extending them like we do in the Stuart platform. Uh, but this is a, an extremely robust uh, and very dexterous six degree of freedom manipulator um, that has a lot of the same uh, adaptability as um, a, a typical under actuated hand. So some other major benefits of under actuation that we are leveraging these days in my lab is that um, the passive adaptability facilitates uh, grasping and manipulation despite uncertainty or errors. Um, and this is kind of akin to shooting first and ask questions later. We can successfully grasp an object and even successfully manipulate an object without having any kind of model or really any kind of knowledge to some extent of the hand object system. Uh, and we can even take that further and acquire some of that information if desired, we don't even need it necessarily, uh, via manipulation, which allows us to um, start to apply data-driven and other approaches to learning uh, hand object configuration and learning controllers for, um, for manipulation and in-hand uh, manipulation. So one of the first examples from the lab on this um, was, um, Using a simple visual servering based approach, we um, took a camera uh, that was mounted over top of this uh, two fingered hand and uh, without knowing anything uh, about the hand control, um, we had a, a binary Jacobian um, of that hand uh, with two actuators and we just wrapped a controller around the um, center of the object basically and tried to servo it to a desired location here shown in as a yellow dot and uh, just with on the left simple PID control on the right with a more complicated model predictive control uh, are able to um, do really robust manipulation of that object um, uh, without any knowledge of the hand object system. The, uh, the under actuation really just um, allows you to deal with the uncertainty in the error without dropping the object essentially. <clears throat> in this example, um, we've been doing a lot of work with data-driven approaches. Um, and here we are uh, grasping uh, objects. Something wrong here. Go back. So in this example, um, we start to use um, vision to extract features um, from the hand object system, and then use those features in various learning frameworks in order to, um, uh, to learn about the, uh, the manipulation example that we're doing uh, and generate uh, models and controllers um, of the hand object system. Here, uh, we use some data-driven approaches to uh, learn a, a model and a, a controller of the hand. And um, the features here are chosen in a way that is focused on mechanics of the grasping and manipulation task. And doing it in such a way enabled us to learn models that transferred very robustly to novel hands and objects. Um, so in this example, we took um, planar hands and we changed the um, the, the length and shape of the fingers uh, in order to, um, to make a, a new, completely new situation. Uh, and these, um, these models perform very robustly across a, a range of novel hands. And then the last example I'm gonna talk about is um, configuration estimation um, during within hand manipulation. So in this example, we used a particle filtering based approach to, um, to start off with some uh, hypotheses of the estimation or uh, of the um, configuration of the hand. Uh, so we don't have any feedback here. Um, the, the, the visual feedback is just really looking at um, how the um, object in, uh, uh, moves with respect to the base of the robot. And by observing how that uh, object moves with the random actuator movements that we're providing, uh, we can eliminate hypotheses uh, or the, eliminate the particles that don't jive with the motion that we observed. 
and um, quickly um, uh, narrow down to the true configuration of the hand object system and then use that controller uh, to robustly control the hand. So here's just an example of doing that with these objects and then um, uh, drawing out the letters IJRR uh, using the, the knowledge of the configuration of the hand object system. All right, so I will stop there for this talk. Um, I guess you can't actually ask me any questions uh, right now, but feel free to email me if you have any uh, questions about this work. Um, and I just wanna acknowledge the, the people from my lab, uh, Lyle Odner, Julia, Connor, Burke, Hong, Walter, and Andy, who did the work that I presented in this uh, talk. Thank you. <laughs>